purposes of any kind of copyright or anything. All this lesson is coming from the Living World series, Purpose and God's Plan, from the Pentecostal Publishing House. And uh, like I said, just want to give honor where honor's due. Don't want nobody getting mad at us because we're not giving them what's owed to them. But the, the, this quarter is the purpose and plan of God. And the title of the lesson, I want to say, has been mentioned a little bit in the last few services we've had, but it's talking of the chiefest of sinners. This is a title that Paul gives himself in some of his writings, and we're going to get to that eventually. But this lesson this morning really goes into the story of Stephen, and, and when he was, he was martyred, he was killed, but it gets into a lot of really deep stuff, and I'm not going to lie, and then it just kind of throws in a, oh, by the way, Paul was there, and, and his name was Saul. And it, it honestly, seriously, that's kind of how the lesson goes, but just focusing a little bit on just Timothy, well, from First Timothy, I was reading as I was talking, talking about Stephen, we're going to see a really good model, a really good example of how we can carry things. Sister Christy was talking about a while ago about, you know, there's a lot of people out to get the president. Well, there's, there's forces out to get me and you this morning just That's as right. strong, just as, just as hard, just as trying. And we're going to look into that this morning. The focus thought for this morning's lesson is we have all sinned and need God's grace and mercy. You can almost shut the book. We can pack up and go home. There really ain't too much to add to that phrase right there. We have all sinned and needs God's grace and mercy. But we're going to go on with the lesson. Our focus verse is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It says that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, lesson text, I won't reread that verse. We'll go on with verse 16. It says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy. All the songs this morning went right along with this mercy, grace, that in me, first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now go to the book of Acts, reading a few verse, scriptures out of verse set, chapter 7, 54th verse. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Now, that was our lesson text for today in the Culture Connection, titled, The Most Evil Man in the World. This man was dubbed as this phrase. He was dubbed the most evil man in the world. His name was Joshua Milton Blahey. Probably not pronouncing that right at all, but. But his victims and his soldiers knew him by a different derogatory name. By his own admission, he slaughtered at least 20,000 civilians during the Civil War. In his memoir, described one of his worst acts. He killed a child by opening, this is quotation, opening the little girl's back and plucking out her heart. Her blood was still on his hands when he heard a voice called him by his last name, Blahi, turned around and saw a man standing there brighter than the sun who said, Repent and live or refuse and die. That's from, I'm assuming, a book, the way they have it titled here, called The Greater the Sinner. All right. He could not escape the passion or the pull of those words. He left fighting and began sleeping on a church pew as he wrestled with those words. The pastor gathered his congregation and prayed for God to strip Joshua Milton of his demonic powers, and God did. One pastor reported, 
Not since the conversion of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus have I ever heard a conversion story so compelling. Since that day he had combed the villages for his victims to apologize for his cruelty and beg their forgiveness. Saul of Tarsus was his generation's Joshua Milton. He terrorized Christians, but Jesus got his attention. Saul repented, was born again, and lived his life to glorify Jesus. Little wonder he called himself the chief of sinners. But since God forgave Saul, the chief of sinners, and Joshua Milton, the most evil man in the world, or since he forgave them, he can forgive us. Now, on September, on a September day in Chicago, a stern a plainly dressed man was seen standing on a street corner in the busy loop. As people were hurrying about, he solemnly lifted his right hand, pointed to the nearest person, and loudly said a single word. He would just point it and go, guilty. Next person come back by, guilty. He did this without any change of expression and resumed his stiff stance for a short period and repeated the process again. Over and over, he raised his right arm, pointed to a person, and declared guilty. The reactions of the pedestrian were almost eerie. It was as if they didn't know how to respond. One man, describing how many others likely felt, turned around to another person and exclaimed, But how did he know? Paul declared that he was the chiefest of sinners, that rec that recognition allowed him to also realize that the only way to remove the guilt and shame of sin was to open, to be open and honest before God. Now we're going to start in like here, like I said, we're going to talk about Stephen this morning. Stephen did a lot of great signs and wonders or God did signs and wonders through Stephen. I'll word it that way. Um, he's not mentioned a whole lot in the New Testament, but the book's, book, book of Acts, I cannot talk this morning, gives us insight to just how important he was to the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 6 verse 8 tells us that he was filled with faith and power. Now, they're saying in this lesson that in this in the way translation and the words were used in the, in the Bible and the way it was written that the word faith right here is more properly interpreted as grace. His life was marked by being filled with the grace and power of God. The verses go on to tell us how Stephen did a lot of great signs and wonders. Now among that, he done them among the people. You know, we understand that God is using Stephen to do these. How he's able to do it is through the faith and power for these works to be manifested in him. It took some doing on Stephen's part. And we look and read these scriptures a lot of times of how people in the, in the Bible times, Acts from then on, and God was using everybody when they were preaching and they were doing healings. And they were casting out spirits and all these different things. And you almost want to put in your mind that that doesn't happen anymore, that it can't happen anymore. That was only back in that time. But all it takes is our faith, believing that the power of God is real and that God can use us and manifest it to our lives. Now, like Brother Ray teaches, it, it, it goes right with this this morning. we got to remember any kind of gift gift of healing. You know, we may try to categorize things if it was up to us. Oh, you're a doctor. Okay, well, you need the gift of healing. Oh, uh, okay, well, you're an English professor, so you're going to need the, the gift of tongue interpretation. You know, those fit pretty well. Those look like they line up. But when it comes to who God wants to use for what gift or what gift to be manifested to a person, we don't really have a say-so on who gets what. It's what God deems what God looks for. And there's a lot of people who want blessings of God. They want things to flow through them, but they're not willing to fill their lives with the grace and power necessary for that to happen. For grace to flow through your life and God to do something with you, that means you had to give up. You had to turn your life totally to Him. 
Our liberty is the way it's written right here. And you know, liberty, that's freedom. Our chance, our opportunity to say yes to God comes only from our discipline to say no to sin. She said, I mentioned the other night how what God really calls for, we think he's asking for so much. But what he really, if you boil it down to what it is, God wants us to live a life of discipline. Being a disciplined person, not reacting to every single notion or urge that we have. Having a life of restraint in everything that we do. That's what God is wanting because when you're restraining yourself, God's able to let his power flow through us. Well, Stephen's allowing God to move through him, but he's beginning to see some opposition. The religious leaders didn't like seeing what they were seeing. And that's kind of odd to say, but they're seeing good things go on. And they're not liking it. They argued with him. When anyone does great things for God, there will be opposition. But just like Stephen did, if we can make it a practice to preach wherever we go. No, when I say preach, I don't mean standing in the middle of a store, Bible in one hand, preaching a sermon to the top of our lungs. Letting your life be a sermon. Let just dealing with people with love and compassion the way that God did us. Stephen did this, and in doing so, while he's doing this, you think you've got a lot of opposition? says that five synagogues rose up against him. And they weren't meaning to just shut him up for now. They were meaning something serious. But they rose up against him for doing absolutely nothing but preaching Christ. Now, when you think of what's going on here, you know, the scripture says they arose. They stood up against him. They bowed up at him. Hey, you're going to shut up. You're going to stop teaching him. They accuse him of a lot of different things. Why? Well, he's teaching against everything they know. You know, in their mind, they're thinking, look, this is the way daddy done it. This is the way granddaddy done it. This is the way great. We've done it this way all this time, and now here you are telling us that it's, it's void. It, it doesn't need to be done such a way anymore. We need to change. We have to do something different. Most people, it's kind of a common thing throughout everybody. Some don't like it more than others, but nobody likes change. One of the biggest reasons why this year has been so hard is not yet yeah, the virus has been horrible and there are all kinds of other things that we've had to go on this year, but it's the changes, the changes we had to make. We had to adapt to the way we live our everyday life. Well, we're not living everyday life here on this earth. These men are hearing of an opportunity at an eternity. Living forever. Immortality. They're hearing of all these different things that they are thinking in their mind is impossible. They think it cannot be right. It's got to be, the, it's got to be this way or no other way. This is the only way it could ever be. When Stephen is trying to show them the better way that God provided. Well, what's happening here is sin had made them comfortable enough to reject what they needed most. They're needing deliverance. Even though they didn't understand what was being said, they still heard the words that Stephen was saying, but the enemy never likes truth to be preached. Okay? The devil was like the way that they were thinking. They had their own way. They were in their synagogues. They were doing their teachings. No, maybe they weren't necessarily teaching anything wrong, but they just weren't teaching enough. But even with all of this opposition coming against Stephen, he remained steadfast. He never slowed down. Those who opposed him could not sway him from his message. Uh, Acts chapter 10, 6 verses 9 through 10 tells us that they disputed with him, but they could not refute his wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. When we allow the Lord to fill our mouths and guide our spirits, nothing the enemy can say will move us. You're rooted too hard. You're too steep in the ground. You got, you're standing on that solid rock. Nothing can move it if it's coming from God. And in this point, Stephen was. 
says that it stirred up the people. Now, if the enemy can't silence us one way, they'll look for another one. Acts 6 and 12 said that they stirred up the people. When, it, when, when they couldn't confront him, their self and get him to hush, they stirred up the people. When they realized they couldn't persuade him, they couldn't silence him, they couldn't get him to stop preaching, they didn't give up and say, oh, well, we tried. They simply turned to other means. They stirred up the people. The elders, the scribes, they came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Verse 15 said, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Sin refuses to listen to truth and will continue to fight against it. Doesn't matter what they saw. Doesn't matter what kind of evidence you show. If it is the devil in them, the devil is going to turn away. He is going to refuse to listen to truth and will continue to fight against it. The leaders of these five synagogues realized they would not prevail, so they appealed to the people, causing to turn the people on Stephen. The thing to remember is sin is never content with just creating a small disturbance. You know, just one little thunderstorm and kind of gear thing. No, 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 no. It wants the hurricane. It wants to shake and destroy everything it's in, everything it's around. That's why I tell, you know, I, and I haven't said it in a long time, but the devil is not only after me. He's not only after you. He's after you and everything that has your name on it. Your youngins, your house, if it's got your name on anything to do with it, he's after the whole package. So he's not content with just going for one small thing. He wants everything thrown in together. The more the people that could be stirred up against Stephen, the better chance there would be to silence him. Now it's only the same things that the devil still is doing today. They brought him up to the Sanhedrin. They, they brought false witnesses in to lie about what Stephen had said. They accused him of committing blasphemy. And they were saying that he was teaching against the law and the temple of God. They're lashing out. But even still, when sin may lash out, God will still sustain us. He never stopped and he's never going to. With all of this going on, knowing that God would sustain What's happening? Stephen never wavered. He never slowed down. Now, it's just like Stephen right here. He knows who he's talking to. He understands the power that they have. He's under. He knows. They hear the words I'm saying. They know I'm speaking the truth. So he's standing there. He didn't really fully understand what was going on, like this says, revival brings persecutions. We don't always see what's going on behind the scenes, behind the curtain in the realm of the Spirit. Stephen was seeing a great revival as a result of his ministries. He's seeing people being converted. He's seeing lives changed. He's seeing great things happen. Now, in our mind, and maybe even in Stephen's, we were, you think, how could anybody go against this? Or how can anyone say that this is bad? But think of how we're doing now. This is a war that we are fighting in. During the greatest seasons of revival, this is a war. The enemy will fight us the most. When the devil realizes he's losing ground, that's how a war works. If, if you've got, if everything's going good, if no, they're, they just saying the enemy can't break through your forces, you can just kind of hold where you are, maybe even advance and push them further back. But the moment that you realize you're losing ground and they're pushing you back, your army is kind of being backing up. You send more in to help the fight. The devil will do the same thing. Now, during your greatest seasons of revival, the enemy is going to fight us the most. All right? Think back um, pre-COVID, before this all started, before the virus started. 
We could go months at a time, or there, and there were several instances where this happened, where everybody was doing good, there really wasn't a whole lot of sickness going on, everything was great, um, you know, everybody was pretty well, every service, everybody was here, boy, nobody's, nobody's you know, missing services, this is great, it's doing good. We come in contact with an evangelist or someone, and we, Brother Ray feels led to have them preach us a revival, so we decide to go through maybe a three or four night revival. Now, I just said, everything's been going fine. And in the moment the date is set for the revival or the first day of that revival start, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's car tears up. Someone else gets sick. Someone else's youngins get sick. And it begins to try to see, you see the devil try to fight to keep people away from the revival services. Now that's not putting, a lot of people think that we put so much emphasis on a revival service being so much greater than any other service. The same God that's in a revival service is in the same God that's in the day services. So that anything could still happen, but the devil still doesn't want the opportunity, doesn't want the chance to arise because maybe someone is just that one step. You know, it describes when it talked about Saul the road to Damascus, you know, scales on his eyes, and then when he went into what God told him to do, the scales fell off. Maybe you're just one or two scales away from being complete and being completely converted, or somebody's just that one notch away from their next breakthrough, and the devil doesn't want to lose that ground. He's going to send out his forces to stop. During the greatest seasons of revival, the enemy will fight us the most. It's almost that thing of when things seem like they're going really good, is the time to be getting ready for something else. Preparing for war during a time of peace. Well, why can't I enjoy the peaceful time for what it is? Oh, please do enjoy it for what it is, but understand that it won't last forever. Brings me to a point I want to bring up, and I'm not claiming to be any kind of anything special, uh, but I do pay attention to stuff more than I kind of let on and more than some people realize. But okay, listen to this now. We're less than a month away from the election. Okay. Hopefully President Trump makes a full recovery. I, I, I watched a video he put either last night or early this morning. He says he's doing great, he's doing fine. Uh, whatever he's doing seems to be working. So we're going to have the election come up. Persecution. Revival brings persecution. No, no, he's not any kind of spiritual messiah or nothing like that. I'm not saying that either. But a lot of the forces that are fighting against putting him in the White House for a second term, if he does win, he gets that second term. It won't take much for a thought process to begin to come again into the minds of those opposing him, and, well, you know who put him in office, right? Them church folks would put him in. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying that is going to happen, but I am saying be ready for it. Be ready to see some negative attention turning to the church like we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Be ready. We don't know. Hey, he can win it. Everything can be hunky-dory. Who knows? I pray that that is what happens. But without God intervening, I don't see it going that smoothly. Now, going talking about a plan for patriarchs and kings, I'll get off of that subject and get back into the lesson. The chief priests begin to question Stephen. <clears throat> he told them of God's plan from the patriarchs to the prophets to the kings. They looked Stephen in the eye and asked him if these accusations were true. Oh, remember I told you that you know, they were accusing him of blasphemy. He's teaching against the temple. He's teaching against the old law. He's doing all these different things. And instead of being silent while standing in front of the Sanhedrin, Stephen became bold and preached a message of conviction with no fear even though he knew that the people he's preaching to hold the power to put him to death. But he bold. He preached a message of conviction. 
But the way he done it wasn't like what so many preachers want to do today where they just get up behind a pulpit snorting and snotting and slobbering and foaming at the mouth almost, letting everybody know how and when and where and why they're going straight to hell. That's not the kind of conviction message that Stephen preached. He started to break things down by making it appealing to them. He appealed to the truth that they already knew. He was using facts and points that he knew they couldn't turn, they couldn't deny. Because it's what they had been teaching. It's what they had been taught. It's what they were teaching other people. It was what they believed. He was beginning by, with appealing to the truth and knew that they had already accepted it. He spoke of the promises God made Abraham. He knew they would understand that. He spoke of Isaac and of Jacob and how God had dealt with both of them. Then he reminded them how God raised up Moses to be a deliverer for the Jewish people. Then he began to spend a little bit of time on trying to weave together the story of Moses and the plan of God to redeem Israel as a foreshadowing of what God desired to do for all sinners. He tried to help them see that Jesus was the Messiah that their forefathers had been looking for. And I love how he didn't just, you know, he gets to, he, in a minute, he, 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 I want to read this next slide. Yeah, he did kind of get on, but he didn't start there. He, he had enough wisdom that was coming from God. You know, and Paul later does this with people he would talk to, the people he would teach. You know, he would begin, he was so well educated, he would begin to use, I want to say quotes or things that some of their own poets that they liked at that time had said and would use that to kind of use as his hook. Now, Acts chapter 7 verse 51 is when Stephen did get a little ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. There was still, he had to confront what was there. At some point, sin has to be confronted head on. There's no way around it. I, I'm not really going to add more to that phrase. There's nothing else to do with it but confront it. I've always been the type of person, if I feel like, hey, I, I, I'd rather go talk to somebody. Sin is a head, heart, and spirit issue. It takes up the whole person. And they've got to confront it. I'm not meaning we got to run and try to be little Jesuses and go running person to person to person to person and let them know every little thing they're doing wrong. We're not critics. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. But at some point, you've got to face your own sin. We should all be thankful for the ministers in our lives who will stand and boldly declare what sin is and what sin will do to us. Our hearts should always be moved by the convicting truthfulness of God's Word. And that's what the Sanhedrin in this moment is having preached to them, a convicting truthfulness. Yeah, things is being called out. Things is being said to them that they're not liking what they're hearing. We all go through times like that. But you know, there used to be a time when a minister, a pastor, or whatever title you want to use in your mind, everybody's got their reverend, everybody's got different ones that you use in your mind. If you introduced or you were introduced of having any one of those before your name, there was a lot of respect that kind of automatically came with it. You're losing that. You're not seeing that much no more. You know, the world we live in today, there's a lot of hatred towards police officers, law enforcement of all types. And, and, and to be honest with you, there's a lot of people that claim to not hate them that do. If you listen to the way they talk and what they say, they say they're all crooks. 
Well, they're not all crooks. They're all crooked. They're all out for themselves. No, they're not. That same thought process is now being applied to preachers because of some bad apples. Yes, there have been some who were only out for themselves. Yes, there were only some who were only out to give credit or get credit for things and wanting this and wanting that and maybe even trying to do some kind of weird get rich thing. And I still just don't see how that could possibly work. But they still want to do it. And because there's been a few bad apples... There's people wanting to just turn their nose up to the whole batch. And that didn't just start. Brother Ray has stood up here before and said that if his own daddy ever known he grew up to become a preacher, he would roll over in his grave. It's, all, it's been a long time going, but it's some of the opposition that we're facing. It's not just preachers that are going to face it. It's anybody who is in a church. Things are going to come. Our heart should always be moved by the convicting truthfulness of God's Word. Now, one question to ask yourself is how do I respond when I hear preaching that convicts my heart? Do we get mad at God? Do we get mad at the person that said it? Do we get mad at the situation that brought it on? Or do we open our heart and say, yeah, Lord, I'm sorry, you know, and, and do, we, do we mean it with repentance? Remember now, nobody is exempt from this. <laughs> While at the very beginning we read, it, we are all sinners and we all have need God's grace. All have sinned. But because God all has sinned, God has put in a plan. Since the very first sin in the Garden of Eden, God has desired to save and redeem us. He puts together a plan in motion. John 3, 16, For God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's desire to save us and bring us back to a right relationship with him since the start, since the moment that it happened, it's never in the heart of God to cast away the one who sinned. Sometimes we may wonder. Sometimes we want to give up on. Sometimes we think this isn't ever going to work. But God said the hand of God has continually been reaching for those who have fallen into sin to extend mercy. Not calling out a conviction. Not saying anything negative or beating down with it or using it against them later but to give mercy. Now, Stephen's teaching this and he's preaching this message. I'm going to read that again. You know, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. <laughs> Good gracious, the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, y'all killed him. He teaches, he's preaching this convicting message. You know, we ask the question. How do we respond when we hear preaching that convicts? Huh? We don't need to react the way they're fixing to. In Acts 7 and 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. He achieved his mission. They felt conviction. That's what God wants, for you to feel your, the convictions. Come on. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They started biting. They become a pack of rabid dogs on him. Come on. They lashed out at him. And it's funny how they were thinking if we shut him up, there wasn't going to be another group coming later going to be teaching and preaching the exact same thing. Or that by getting rid of Stephen, the conviction was going to be gone. That's just not, that's simply just not how this works. Cut to the heart. They felt the conviction. As I said, Stephen achieved his goal. They felt the conviction 
And they had the same two choices that we have. Find a place of repentance or harden your heart. That is a choice that we make. But the people turned in a rage against Stephen. Instead of allowing the conviction to soften their heart and turn them toward God, they turned in the rage. They began to gnash on him with their teeth. They'd become like a pack of dogs, like I said, and they could not wait to tear into Stephen. The angry mob began to cry for blood. And in this moment, even with all of this going on, you would think that Stephen would begin to fear for his life. Like I said a while ago, when he was in front of the Sanhedrin, and he's calling them stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart. You know, the, the, the one, the just one came and you kill him. He's teaching and preaching all of these things to them and, he's, and the conviction is being felt knowing these people could make the decree to have me killed today. Now maybe he just kind of felt like they're going to kill me anyway so I have nothing to lose. Maybe he was in that frame of mind. I don't know. But you would think for a moment at this point in time, now that the mob has turned on him, that he would begin to fear for his life and maybe, you know, he's heart racing, he done got a little nervous, knees done started knocking, maybe trying to find a way to escape, maybe trying to, maybe thinking in his mind, man, who's going to come down in here and help me fight these people off? Who's going to help me? What's going to happen? Is anybody going to come help? But it says that he being full of the Holy Ghost simply lifted up his eyes looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He, he saw a vision in the midst of this. God was there. Not only was he just there, he was there with a strong enough presence that Stephen saw this vision. He didn't, he didn't stop. He continued on what he was doing continued to preach, even though they were seeking to destroy him, Stephen saw his God high and lifted up. Now, verses 57 through 60, when it actually begins to talk about them stoning him, it says that then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and covered their ears up. They ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Same one. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, there are some people who teach that Stephen never felt the stone hit him. That he, lay, he, just, he laid down, he went to sleep till the stone, till they killed him, and that was the end of it. I don't know. I wasn't Stephen. I wasn't there. But I do know something a little bit about when somebody gets hit with a rock of a sizable, you know, when I was about Rebecca's age, my cousin was throwing rocks at me. Now, granted, he wasn't picking up nothing that wasn't but about a quarter size rock. But I eventually got tired of it. And I've always kind of been my personality. Once I decide to make a move, I make the whole move. <laughs> I got me a rock that's about the size of a baseball. And the way they run at Stephen, I closed the distance between me and him because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss. I chucked that rock. Granny's got a picture somewhere of me and my cousin standing in front of her front door. And I've got that rock. It's, it's taken up the whole palm of my hand. My cousin's standing next to me with his eyes swollen up in black. <laughs> now, I'll throw this out there. He never threw a rock at me ever again wow. of any size. Just wow. say it. But when that rock hit him, he wasn't coherent enough to be saying, 
Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Or kneeling down and crying out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know, he, he was pretty much, he was screaming, ow, crying, you know, all that would come with that. So you can kind of just take with that what you want to think about it. For him to be able to, some might say, oh, he didn't lay down and go to sleep. One of them rocks knocked him out. He fell out and didn't feel it from then on. Well, even that, wouldn't have that been a blessing from God? So, you know, don't get so caught up in some little thing, trivial things such as that, but just like I've been saying, the fact is, it happened. Stephen died in victory. He never wavered no matter how thick the opposition got. When it was just an argument, when it was just a confrontation, he never slowed down. He never turned away. When it become an outright mob out to kill him, he never slowed down. He never turned away. Now, that's kind of where they stopped talking about Stephen, as good as that had been. They start talking about some enter Saul. He was the keeper of the coats. He was the one kind of interesting twist. And... Um, the way they write it is here is where the story presents the twist and makes an incredible change in direction. It is here that we are introduced to someone who has not yet been identified to us. A young man in the crowd finds himself tasked with keeping the coats of those who are picking up stones to hurl at Stephen. Honestly, he should not have been that important to the story. His name really had no real reason to be inserted. There really shouldn't have been any mention of him being there. Stephen's name is the only name that has been revealed to us out of all of this involved in this story. But the Bible goes on to give us his name, Saul of Tarsus. He would go on, become the one persecuting Christians. He kind of took the lead from what he saw that day with them killing and stoning Stephen. Because you remember, Saul thought he was doing the right thing. They thought they were. They felt that conviction and they didn't know what to do with it and they were trying to prove that oh, he's, teaching, he's teaching against everything that we've ever known. Y'all, there are teachings, there are things in this world outside of church and our home and are in the world around the world today. There are teachings that people have been doing for generations that just because they've been doing it for a long time does not mean it's right. They were doing some teachings that for a time it was right, but what he was trying to get them to understand, Stephen was trying to tell them, look, since the man that you killed, since the man that you persecuted, and you crucified him, hung him on that cross, there is a door opened up full of mercy and grace for us to change from what we had were before. He was trying to teach them Jesus. He was trying to teach them the same ways of conversion that God wants us to be teaching people in the world today. Now we looked at all that go on then. Saul, he was the eyewitness of the cruel death of Stephen. He saw the anger of the crowd, but he also had to have seen the peace of Stephen. Maybe that's why when the time came on the road to Damascus and God revealed himself to Saul, Saul was willing to accept. Although it would be kind of hard to not accept put yourself in his shoes exactly the way that that meeting had transpired uh, it would be kind of hard to not turn your life but just thinking of the things that he was seeing here he saw the anger, he saw the bloodlust in their eyes he saw Stephen's peace he called himself the chiefest of printers of sinners printers sin is sin that's it. In God's eyes, sin is sin. There's no big, there's no little, there's no medium, there's no, you know, we got different, there's no, oh, well, you, you know, you just got the, some religious beliefs, they kind of put it in a monetary stance. Oh, that's a $50 sin. Pay $50, you know, you're good. Oh, that's a big one. You got to pay $150 and you'll be all right. Oh, good gracious, you went all out with that one. You got to pay $1,000 and then you'll be all right with that one. They think that it's at a level, but it's not. To God, sin is simply sin. We can't adequately rank one sin over the other, even if we wanted to. All right? 
while we are judgmental by nature, and it's a nature that we have to overcome, God is the only judge of sinners. Now, remember 1 Timothy 1 and 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Sometimes a preacher, some like to put their stuff up on a pedestal. Oh, I'm up here. Y'all are down there. But here this man is, here Paul is saying, oh, he didn't come to save you sinners. He said come to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the head honcho. I'm the worst one of the bunch. And it would be kind of hard to argue that he wasn't. He was a man responsible for the death of Christians. He was responsible for the torture of Christians. They hadn't done absolutely anything wrong. They had only tried to live a life different than what everybody at this point in time in history were used to seeing. This should give you hope if even the worst sinner can be delivered by the power of Jesus, whom I am chief. Why would we think we could be so bad or do so wrong that God couldn't help us and he couldn't eliminate ours, our sins? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we talked last Sunday about the, uh, uh, um, writing on the wall, you know, the, you've been weighed, you've been measured. We've all been weighed, we've been measured, we've all been found wanting. We've all come short of the glory of God. And for that reason, God does not turn us away. He doesn't set us on the back burner. He doesn't say, well, I'll get to you when I have time. He comes to us with his hands, arms open and is full of grace and mercy. No human being is exempt from sin's grasp or God's glory. There's nothing, there's no, oh, they're just better than I am, they're stronger than I am, or they come from a different line, or their bloodline's different than mine, they're, they're sinners, they just have no hope, oh, they're God people, they're just going to be God's people. It's not one or the other. You're not exempt. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of yourselves, not anything you can do. It is only through your faith that God can change us. Without his grace and mercy, we have absolutely no hope. But thankfully, we all have access to his grace and his mercy. Now, in closing, we're blessed with the opportunity to be convicted by the word often. Scripture is for, one of the things it's for is for correction, for reproof. It's a blessing to see, for, to be able to say, okay, God, I see, what, I see where I was doing wrong, and I want to change it. I want to do that better. I'm going to do that the right way. It's not something... I heard of an individual the other day. They quit a football team when they were in high school because they got tired of everybody else would be done, everybody else would quit, and the coaches were just always on them. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And they said, well, I'm not doing it. If I'm the only one doing it, I'm quitting. And they walked off. God, sometimes we feel like we've been singled out by God. A situation like that on a team of any kind or in a classroom, or on our jobs, or anything like that. We don't like being singled out, and we sometimes we feel like we have been and can't understand why. Sometimes it's for negative things. I will throw that out there. Sometimes it's just because someone's got something against you, and they just want to throw as much on you as they can. Sometimes it's because they see something in you. I kind of wondered that when the young man was telling me that story. Well, maybe there was some talent there that the coaches saw that they were trying to pull out of it that they were trying to get him to, to see, God sees what we can be. You know, I said a while ago, we don't see what's going on behind the curtain. We don't see what's behind the scenes in the realm of the Spirit. And I say again, that's for our own safety. If God was to reveal to you what the devil has holding back, wanting to turn loose on you, 
we'd have to lock you up in a padded room somewhere and give you a Crayola crayon so you could draw on the walls the rest of your life. It would drive you that crazy. It would drive any one of us insane if we saw what was there. Well, we don't see the testimony coming about a while ago. I don't always know where I'm going. I don't always know where this is headed. That makes things a little hard. If you know right where you're going, eh, easy peasy. But if you don't have a clue, God does. He knows where we're going. He knows what we can become if we allow him in his convictions to mold us and be like Stephen and not waver and not falter and not kind of duck around behind and hide from certain ones or certain things or certain situations and understand that the grace and mercy can change the most hardened sinner. It's got us changed. God's got everything worked out for us down the road. We just continue to work for him on our journey and our past is not strong enough to stop the power of God. Sometimes we think it is. But if the very one chief of sinners held the coats of them that stoned Stephen and then went on in to persecute who knows, hundreds and thousands, who knows the number of Christians that he did persecute. But like Paul, we got to realize we are the chiefest of sinners and be willing to open our hearts to forgiveness daily. Paul had a lot of guilt. That's why he said he died daily. Maybe there's things throughout his day or things happening and he just, okay, I got to, I got to every day open my heart to God's forgiveness. Now, no, that doesn't give us a license to do what we want and then just make sure that every night before we go to bed we tell God we were sorry for it and then get up the next morning and go do the exact same thing. That's not what we're talking about here. Heart to forgiveness. This is what we want to spread to people. This kind of message is kind of what I want and would like to see happening if things work out to where we get to have the, the fish fry thing in March. Letting people know God's grace and His mercy is sufficient for everybody. We don't need to forget. I grew up, and I'm going to throw this point out there, and then I'm going to stop. Y'all know I grew up hunting. I hunt all the time when I get the chance. And even as much as I've done it, I understand where the ideal spot on the animal is. It's violent, it sounds vulgar and violent, but to shoot them because I understand the anatomy of them, I've studied it to know I want to kill it as quickly as possible. I don't want it to suffer, so I know exactly. But you know, I'll still watch videos on YouTube. I'll still read articles in magazines about shot placement and all these different things. Even though I already know it, I want to keep it fresh in my mind. Remember like we've been talking about the last several weeks here now. If you have a plan in place when the moment arises, you're not worried about trying to figure out what you're going to do. You already have it planned. Here's our plan this morning. Don't waver no matter the opposition that comes at us. Keep your faith and trust in God and keep keeping on with the work God has us to do. Does anyone have anything to add or questions for this morning?